There's a path along life's highway, so common and well trod. Find the shoes that burden the Christians who won't put their trust in God. Welcome to The Liberating Secret with your host, author and teacher, Sylvia Pierce. The Liberating Secret is dedicated to revealing the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the only hope of glory. Let's join Sylvia Pierce for today's lesson. Welcome to The Liberating Secret. My name is Sylvia Pierce, and I'm so glad to be with you today. I'm doing a studies, a series actually, in the book of 1 Corinthians, and I'm just about to wind down to the end finally. I mean, I've had many, many lessons because there's so many, th so much to say in this letter to the Corinthians, and uh, and I intend to go on into the into Second Corinthians as well, but uh, maybe uh, at a different time. So. Let me just recap a little bit because uh, chapter 12, of course, Paul is bringing out the spiritual gifts and um, and uh, he talks about the diversities of service and but one church and he said and he and the diversities of gifts, yet one spirit, they're all given by one spirit. I love the way he says that. And the diversities of, in, the mem, in, in the members of the body of Christ, but one body. So there's many but one, many but one. And I love, I've always loved this in the scriptures. There's all these paradoxes in the scriptures that show up and how really both are true. And the natural mind has a hard time putting together paradoxes because we, we tend to think it has to be either or. And so many religions are built upon either or when really both are n normally true. I always say that uh, spirit reality yields itself in pairs of opposites. I mean, one, of, one thing that I like quoting about that is Jesus said, um, I, I, ca I didn't come to judge, but if I do judge, my judgment is true. And I say, and I always say, well, Jesus, which is it? You didn't come to judge, but if you judge, your judgment is true, you see. So he really both are true. And of course, we know that he means he didn't come to condemn us. But um, if he discerns where we are and what we really need, his judgment is true. So you have to have the mind of Christ to really reconcile the paradoxes that are in the scriptures, and I think this this chapter 12 is just full of paradoxes because uh, this diversity of, of uh, gifts, but yet they're all given by one spirit, and there's diversities in the, in the body of Christ, yet there's just one body, you see, and diversities of service, but yet there's just one church, so I love it. I love it. It's many but one. It just like, um, I mean, we know this about the um, Trinity. The three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but all one. So this is all through the scriptures, and I, I've, I think I've done some uh, articles about resolving paradoxes. So you might want to look on the internet and see if you can find that article. I think it's pretty good, really. But let me continue on. Uh, we went from there into chapter 13. Everybody loves chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, basically because it says, Yet show I you a more excellent way. More excellent way than what? Then really, um, you, it starts out by saying you can have all the gifts. You can have the great gift of prophecy. You can have faith to move mountains. You can have all these gifts and yet not have love. You don't really have anything. And I think that's certainly a lesson to us today. Love, and this is not talking about even sentimental love. It's not talking about even family love. It's talking about agape love. It's talking about the love of God, the love of Jesus. Sacrificial love is what it's talking about. And so, but you know what? Um, I was thinking the other day, if you put, because First John says that, G, that God is love. So it's not that God's going to give us love. He's going to be it within us. That's, that's the point. There's a lot of times you might not like this or that, but the whole point is God is love. 
And He is the indwelling Spirit within you if you are born again of His Spirit. He is the indwelling Spirit within you, and He is love. So that's why a lot of times I say it's illegitimate to say I don't love the brethren. It's illegitimate of us to say that you might not like this person or that person in your church fellowship, but it's not, it's not, it's totally illegitimate to say you don't love them because basically, because Jesus is in you and Jesus is in them and God is love and Jesus is that love. So what I'd like to do is read is uh, substitute the word Christ in you for the word love because uh, in chapter 13. So let me read it this way. It's, first, let me say it the way the scripture says it. Love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunts it's not itself, is not puffed up. Now let's substitute here. Christ in you suffers long and, and Christ in you is kind. Christ in you envies not, doesn't envy. Christ in you vaunteth not himself. And Christ in you is not puffed up. Wow. And Christ in you does not behave himself unseemly. Christ in you does not seek his own. Christ in you is not easily provoked. Christ in you thinketh no evil against the brethren, basically. Christ in you rejoices not in iniquity but rejoices, but he rejoices in the truth. Christ in you bears all things. Christ in you believes all things. Christ in you hopes all things. Christ in you endures all things. Christ in you never fails. <laughs> That's wonderful. The Christ, the indwelling Christ within you never fails. And his love within you never fails, never fails you and never fails the other members of the body of Christ. But whether there be prophecy, they shall fail. And whether they be tongues, they, fail, they shall fail. And that's why it says at the very end of that chapter, and now abideth faith, hope, and love, or Christ in you, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love, or Christ in you, who is love. Isn't that a great way to interpret that scripture? So we can remember if we don't feel like, maybe we don't, we, we don't feel like any of these things. Now that's our soul. That's our human soul feelings. That's different from Christ in you who is love. Now that's the difference between soul and spirit. Because we might not like, we might like or dislike, and that can be like the weather. One day I might like a person, the next day I might not like them at all. But the whole point is love, Mr. Love, Christ himself, who, who lives his life in me, loves and can love them through me. But he, he will require you to believe it by faith. And that's, what, that's the one requirement of this walk, is a, it, which is, of course, a walk of faith. So let's go on into chapter 14. Chapter 14, I, I'm just going to start reading it from um, the Amplified Version because I think uh, the Amplified Version does a good job there and certainly brings out something that I hadn't really thought of before. Because it's talking about how, pro how prophecy is the greatest of all the gifts of the Spirit in the first place. And this is what it says. Eagerly pursue and seek to acquire this love. Make it your aim, your greatest quest, and earnestly desire and cultivate the spiritual endowment gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Now this is how it interprets prophecy, because I don't think, I hadn't thought of it this way. It interprets it this way. And it, of course it's amplified, so it's going to amplify what they say prophecy is. And that's what, this is what they say. Interpret the divine will and purpose in inspired preaching and teaching. So he, they are interpreting prophecy as inspired teaching and pre preaching. And I love that, of course, I love that. Because I believe 
That's what we need. We we need we we've got lots of preaching and we've got some teaching. I think we have more preaching in the body of Christ than we do teaching. I, that's why I'm always encouraging other teachers because we certainly do need some teachers. And I think I think that's that's certainly growing. But we've got to have divine divine inspiration in order to be able to teach and preach. It's got to be from the Holy Spirit, of course. And so that's what he's saying. Desire that gift. That's prime. That's the primary gift. And then he goes on talking, and he uh, in in chapter fourteen of First Corinthians, he admonishes the Corinthians again. And so many times through this whole book, he is admonishing them. I mean, uh, just think of all the issues that he dealt with in this in this uh, Corinthian letter incest and fornication and uh, taking your brothers or sisters to the law and the lack of discernment, the lack of judgment, the lack of wisdom uh, uh, and uh, confusion and in marriage and the right marriage relationships, misuse of our bodies through Ill illegitimate sex and blood offered to idols and meat offered to idols, eating meat offered to idols and blood offered to idols. And um, so he had a lot of issues that he had to deal with. Then he had to deal with some of the prideful things that the Corinthians were having pride about, and that were their spiritual gifts. And that can be a problem. I mean, we can, we can be pretty enamored with our own spiritual gifts, which they're not our own at all because they're the gift of the Spirit. And he's dealing with that in chapter 14 because these Corinthians were pretty impressed with their gift of tongues. And, and I think they were causing great confusion in the fellowships and in the churches. And so he had to, of course, deal with that. And um, like I always say, Paul didn't want to do it. No, no father really wants to discipline their child, but he had to because if he because he is love, and love must discipline as well as encourage and edify and um, and by the way that reminds me the 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 interpretation I mean the office of prophecy or inspired preaching and teaching here he he says it in verse in chapter. 14 when he says in verse 3 and he that prophesies speaking unto men to edification to exhortation and comfort so all the preaching and teaching should be for edification and for um, exhortation and for comfort so um, and and he admonishes them to desire that gift of prophecy which he's he the um, uh, amplified version interprets it to be preaching and teaching, inspired preaching and teaching. So, but let me read to you in, ver in chapter 14 from the um, uh, Amplified Bible. I couldn't say it. Okay, verse 18. I thank God, and I speak in that I speak in tongues more than you or all of you put together. So he's saying, you know, you're probably um, criticizing me because you haven't heard me speak in tongues, maybe, because you think you're greater because you can speak in tongues. And he says, but I'm telling you, I thank God that I really do speak in tongues probably more than all of you all put together. So <laughs> he's letting them have it. Nevertheless, in public worship, I would rather say five words with my understanding and intellectual intellectual in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in strange tongue language. He's saying, I would much rather speak with a clear understanding than a, than a whole lot of speaking in tongues. Why? Brethren, do not be children immature in your thinking. Continue to be babes in matters of evil, but in your mind, be mature men. He's saying, come on, grow up. Quit arguing and fighting over who has the better gift and quit causing confusion and divisions in your fellowships 
because who speaks in tongues and who doesn't and who's legitimate and who's not and who has the Holy Spirit and who doesn't. My goodness, folks, we need to stop all that and grow up is what he's basically saying. And um, then he says, uh, thus unknown tongues are meant for a supernatural sign, not for believers, but for the unbelievers. So the tongue is really a sign for the unbelievers on the point of believing, while prophecy inspired preaching and teaching, interpreting the divine will and purpose is not for unbelievers on the point of believing, but for believers. So he's saying, so in the churches, when we are, we are, we're to edify and admonish and build up each other in Christ, I mean, there's really no need to be speaking in tongues all the time. And if you do, if you do have, if you do have it, be sure you have an interpreter. So he's setting order to, in this church that's totally out of order. I mean, I can't even imagine what this all looked like, but it was probably a big mess. And so he's, he's putting in order what was totally out of order. And he's telling them, let the, let the prophets honor one another. I mean, honestly, if you're a mature person, you don't have to, you don't have to be disciplined this way. But if you're in a class of kindergarten children, they have to be disciplined a lot to be able to sit down, to be quiet, to don't quit causing confusion. So you see, he's saying, you're still babes. Come on, you grow up and quit causing these divisions and Quit being so impressed because you can speak in tongues. Bless your heart. I'm glad I, you know, I, I, I can do it more than anybody, but I'm not going around boasting about it or being enamored with myself because it's not my gift anyway. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we need to be, we need to be, we need to have adjustment on these, these um, issues. Now, years ago, I went to a Catherine Kuhlman meeting and believe me, she held order in her meetings. And at one time, somebody stood up and started speaking in tongues, and she immediately made them be quiet, sit down, because it, 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 it's disruptive in the um, meeting and causes a lot of confusion and it causes people to be, um, and, and really a diversion away from what the Spirit's doing. And I think that's a real important thing to hold the meeting for the Holy Spirit to be poured out and what the Holy Spirit has to say to the group. And I certainly saw her handle it that way. And I think that is very important. I mean, several times I've done meetings and they do, they can get out of order real quick. I like to open my meetings up sometimes, not all the time with questions and um, and comments along the way. And a lot of times when I'm doing the woman's retreat at Polly's Island, I will tell people, you may interrupt me. Other times I will say, please do not interrupt me with questions. Hold your questions to the end. But sometimes I do. I, I, open, I, I open it up that way because I think even when people ask questions, people that don't know the you know, maybe sitting there thinking the same kind of question, questions, but don't have the courage to ask it, and somebody else might ask it for them. And I think it is encouraging in a, in a group, but it can get out of hand real quick. So I always tell them, look, we're not going to chase rabbits, and if it gets out of hand, uh, I, I know how to get us right back into order real quick. So, and if we need to discuss it further, we'll go in the back room and discuss it. So, and I think that's important to do. I like opening it up, but I also like to keep, I have to keep order. We have to do that because uh, the devil will always find ways to divert you away from the point that the Holy Spirit is bringing out and quench the spirit actually. So that's what Paul is doing in uh, 1 Corinthians 14. He is setting the uh, church meetings and the fellowship meeting straight and um, and putting it in back into order and evidently the um, the women were asking their husbands in the middle of the meeting questions and um, I understood this somebody uh, told me this some time ago they said in in this culture usually the men were on one side and the women were on the other 
and a lot of times the women in the in these circumstances would 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 holler back one to the other to their husband and the husband would answer back would say what did he mean what did the minister mean when he said this you see it's totally out of order and so uh Paul is saying here, so you women be quiet <laughs> when all this is going on. Quit asking your husbands in church. Ask them when uh, you get home. And I think that's absolutely right and proper. And um, any anybody, even you know, a man asking a woman uh, questions out loud in a public meeting would not be proper either. So uh, I think that's what Paul is handling there. And he says, you, you know, let the prophets honor each other. Let the body of Christ honor each other. You know, I used to be uh, w uh, associated with a group that just seemed to steamroll everywhere they went. When we would go to a new place and, and have a meeting, we would just usurp everybody's authority and just do what we wanted to do. And I learned from that that's not the ways of God and that's not the way to conduct meetings. I mean, so it came to me that the most important thing when I go to a new place uh, that God has opened up, that I'm to honor the very people that have, you know, invited me to come as intercessors. And without their intercession, that place would not be opened up. So they're really, you know, they're, I'm to honor them and as, uh, as one that's, plowed the ground and maybe I will come and sow some seeds and and maybe you know I'll come and do some and labor with them together but basically we are workers together in the field of the Lord and we're to honor one another and actually I love what it says in Philippians that have this mind in Christ that was also the have the mind of Christ which honors the other person greater than yourself. And I think that's always wise to do. And I think it's otherwise we're tooting our own horns and um, with pride and um, and we're just too, too overly impressed with ourselves. And that's exactly what was going on in this church. And I think it goes on in our churches today too as well. Not all, but some. And um, I always say, if the shoe fit, wears it, wear it. If it doesn't, then don't wear it. <laughs> so that's exactly how the Bible is meant. When when God is admonishing us, if the shoe fit, that's fine. If it doesn't, you know, maybe it's for somebody else. So you just find out from in your own heart if it fits you. If it doesn't, then that's fine. You know, just move right along. So uh, the end of chapter 14, uh, Paul enter, ends this chapter by saying, let all things done decently and in order. That's the whole point. Let it all be done in order and not disorder. And um, I, 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 I know that's right. And so as we move and grow in the Holy Spirit, we will do that. We will honor one another. We'll bless one another. We'll edify one another. And I always love what Ephesians says. Let me turn to that real quick because I love what Ephesians says about the fivefold ministry and what the job of the fivefold ministry is. This is Ephesians chapter 4. It says this He that descended is the same that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And this is, this, is, uh, this is a definition of what the ministry is. For the perfecting of the saints. I mean, this is the whole realm of what fellowship and what the fivefold ministry is really to do. Well, this is our job, is for the perfecting of the saint, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, not for the tearing down, not for prideful, um, uh, being prideful about your spiritual gifts, but the edifying of the whole body of Christ. If, the, if, another, if a, another member is not like you or not like your fellowship, you know, we don't shun one another. We embrace one another. 
um, in Christ, and I'm not talking about people that are not saved. I mean, some people call themselves Christians and aren't even really saved. So this, this is really to the true body of Christ. And then it says, until we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the multi-membered body of Christ be a perfect man, unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that Christ might be all in all in all of us, so that there, that's all there is, is just Christ being all in all. That henceforth we should not be no more children tossed to and fro, carried away, by every wind of doctrine, you see, the fivefold ministry is meant to, to admonish, up, admonish us, edify us, keep us on track, uh, and, and discipline us if we need it. And uh, because in the last days, and we believe we are in the last days, uh, probably people say that after the crucifixion of Christ was the last days, and that's true up until this day. You see, there are doctrines of demons, and there are many, many around these days, doctrines of demons. So the prophets and the apostles and the pastors and teachers, evangelists, we're to keep the body of Christ into the apostolic, the first apostolic principles and doctrines that Paul, Peter, uh, John, James, all lay down for us in the, in the, in the New Testament. And, and so that the children not be tossed to and fro and carried away by every wind of new doctrine, you know, you know, we're built on one foundation and, and that, that foundation is Christ. And you can search the scriptures and in learning the scriptures, you might think you have eternal life, but if they're not testifying of him, you see, the only real doctrine we have is the doctrine of Christ centered in on Christ himself. You have been listening to The Liberating Secret with Sylvia Pierce. We want to send a special thank you to all our supporters who make this program possible. If you have been blessed by this program and would like to contact Sylvia, you can write her at P.O. Box 43268, Louisville, Kentucky, 40253. That's Post Office Box 43268, Louisville, Kentucky, 40253. You can also find more of Sylvia's teachings on her website. The web address is www.theliberatingsecret.com. That's www.theliberatingsecret.com. And be sure to listen again right here, Monday through Friday at the same time, for The Liberating Secret with author and teacher Sylvia Pierce. So until next time, may God richly bless you.